for many months now, being here at Bushmead and uh, listening to Glyn, his exposition on the Word of God has been really, really amazing. And I'm sure you would agree. So this morning, I would like to, or like us to reflect a little bit on the Word of God as presented through, especially the book of Romans, as uh, he did right through. And now he's entering into John's Gospel, and we'll, we look forward to that great, amazing book. So as we reflect upon what we've heard, even if we've heard it before, we can still drink in and receive from God again and again. But I'd like us to consider there is a purpose. There is a main reason, not the only reason, but the main reason for listening to a preacher, especially like Glyn, and there are others here. Well, what is the main aim of all that? Preaching, the word of God, and being in fellowship together. The main reason is simply this, that we may enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of of heaven. It appears, much to my amazement as I looked at it this week, in the New Testament, around 150 times. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. It's interchangeable. And I do believe that when we get hold of that message, we need to be very careful. We shouldn't take it lightly. We should let it absorb, perhaps, come into our hearts, minds, souls, that God wants us into his kingdom, back into his kingdom. That's another sermon, because we're not in his kingdom. We need to come back into it and have the promise. And as we've already proclaim this morning through the songs and prayers that that is our prospect. Not firstly our duty, but our prospect. Duty follows closely behind, of course. But the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is interchangeable, as I said, is our purpose, our main purpose. But it has to be established and it has to be taken with the rest of Scripture so that we're, we're taught for all the other issues and wonders and what-ifs and so on. They all come together. Now, if we turn to look at some Scriptures, if we look at Matthew in chapter 6, this is a lovely chapter it talks about treasure in heaven. Quite a section there. And then about worry. Wonderful, isn't it? Complete contrast, but it's real. And at the end of the, this section, chapter 6, Matthew, similarly in Luke as well, Jesus says this, your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Those are, if you look at the previous few, uh, many verses from about 25 <clears throat> down to where we are now at 32. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. They are daily needs, practical things, clothes, food, etc. 
And isn't it wonderful? We have this few powerful contrast between what is real and tangible and what is spiritual and everlasting. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but first, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You need those things. Perhaps you'll pay, pray, some of us might pray for our needs straight away because it's there today. Whatever it is, not just practical things or material things, but spiritual things, relationships, etc., and so on. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Romans talks a lot about the righteousness of God. We, we are made righteous by faith. The just shall live by faith. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Again, it's like a sandwich, isn't it? The material, the practical, what we can see. All of us, the whole of humanity. But in the middle, seek the the kingdom of God. Because God will give you these things. Actually, he's already given us the world and all its uh, resources. But it goes on. In, it has to be produced and fashioned and science, etc., etc., of course. So man is working with God, whether he knows it or not, in providing these things. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Do not worry about tomorrow. Well, I'm sure we all do. But the heat can be taken out of it, if I can put it that way. Because it's still there, that problem, that issue. But if you listen to the word and say, Lord, help me in this situation, I believe, I've experienced the heat can come out of it. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day... Each day has enough trouble of its own. He's talking about today. And did you notice? Has enough trouble. The Lord does not promise us that we'll be free of trouble. He's just told us to seek the kingdom of God, the most wonderful, magnificent ever, any human in all of history can ever have is the kingdom of God. And in the next breath he's saying, you have enough trouble each day. Well, a lot would object to that. If God is so great and so good and giving us the kingdom and living in paradise and heaven forever, why doesn't he do something about these things? Well, the short answer is he has. We've already seen part of it in the scripture today. I'd like to quote now We'll get back to that issue in a moment. But I'd like to quote now this wonderful piece which there's many, many scriptures I could have chosen today but this piece really sums up what what we've been hearing so far. And it's from 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9, verse 3 to 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. 
Again, we're there, and then suddenly we're back to reality. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Amen. During (coughs) the Romans uh, passages that we looked at, Paul cries out many times, I can... Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. And again, Paul in prison in Rome, about AD 60, 60 or 61, to the churches... Uh, Ephesians, Colossians, and so forth, that he he had established, and now he's in prison in Rome. He writes this to the Philippians. "I I, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his his death, and so attain to the resurrection from the dead. When we get into this situation of the death and resurrection of Christ, and that we share in that. I'm sure many of us have uh, a pondering and wondering what exactly it's referring to. Well, if we look at the, the death of Christ, he gave himself completely in that act. And in a strange way, he's pointing through scriptures to us to say, you're going there too. We share in the death. It's a very simple point of understanding. None of us can escape that. but we can either share it with Christ or walk away. And uh, once anybody gets to know a little bit, even a cursory glance at Scripture will say that they are invited into the kingdom, his kingdom, through his death. Galatians 5.22 gives us another great indication of the how through this uh, death and resurrection. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, 
you can do nothing. That's John 15, by the way, verse 5. Now the vine produces fruit. And when we go to Galatians 5, verse 22, it talks again about the subject of the sinful nature and the spiritual nature. Those who live like the sinful nature will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this appears many other places. But the, f- the fruit of the Spirit introduces that wonderful thing there. The fruit of the Spirit is nine fruits. Firstly, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't mind admitting there's two or three there which is a work in progress. But the work has progressed, I have to add. And we wouldn't be human, would we, if we uh, denied looking at those items. I think the one that stands out to me is patience. And frustration, especially I think in this day and age, for some reason. But the work is there. I'm aware of it. That's so important, I believe. And I've worked on it. And I have improved. There's room for improvement still. But the Lord is with me. And I am with him. But what a lovely collection of goodness we have in those, those words. I like the fact that it begins with love and ends with self-control. <laughs> Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Well, if we had all those, we would certainly be saints. Actually, we are saints. He gives us that title in his word. Now Paul, as I say, was in prison in Rome and he was writing, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so to it, and so to and so attain to the resurrection from the dead. Death and resurrection. It might, I hope it's not glib to say again, we've got the first part in our sinful nature. Death. But we share in Christ's death because he died for us to take away our sin, therefore we will live in the resurrection. This is a very, very important point. I've made a few words of it, but it's so deep. Recently, Christmas was given one present, uh, several presents we all get, don't we? But one of them was a a book by A.W. Tozer, Tozer, T-O-Z-E-R, and it was written many, many years ago, but there's been um, updates on it. And the whole book is The Crucified Life. That's the title. And um, I, I have to be honest. I, I, I know about these things for many years. I, I became a Christian in, in the late 70s and early 80s, at growing And I didn't fully, after I read that book, it was like a light bulb moment. He 
his death, sharing in his death and resurrection, they are together. You can't separate them because that's the gospel, the good news. So Romans 6, which we had on the screen, I'd like to quickly run forward it before I finish. If we have been united, the English translation sometimes is, is okay, but it's not quite as accurate. I'd love to use the King James um, or even go back to the early tra uh, translations. If we have been united, or well, we have, with him, like, I guess it might be saying that uh, if you believe this, if you'll accept this, then you will be like this in his death. If we have been united with him, like this in his death, and perhaps we should go to the beginning of the chapter, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We therefore, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. They're connected to death and resurrection are connected. And it's, it's not a wonder, is it, when in a few weeks' time, it's Easter, Easter's earlier this year, isn't it, end of March. My birthday is on the 30th, which is Good Friday, <laughs> Holy Friday, actually. It's a, it's a people, people picked up many, many years ago. But it's Holy Friday. But this, the resurrection is three days later, isn't it? Friday, Good Friday, and they are connected. And our lives are connected. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. That one verse sums what I'm preaching about now at this moment. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. It's quite a bit about our old self. You know, God gives us free will. He never takes that away, does he? And the danger is for us is that we can veer back, perhaps through circumstances, perhaps through unbearable um, things that happen to us, an awareness of the problems that we face red, red, uh, daily, perhaps. And where is God in that? He's provided this because I like Glynn's uh, when he said that our lives are that much an eternity you can't get to the end of it. It kind of gives us a, a perspective when we talk about or think about the sufferings that we endure and uh, why doesn't God step in now, today, and change it all? Well, he has in the death and resurrection of himself. For we know that our old self was crucified. So he was crucified, but he crucified our old selves. This is deep stuff, friends, but it's simple in a way. It's wonderful. so that the body of sin might be done away with. So when we go into that new life, there will be none of it. Completely erased. Good news. That, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin because of the resurrection. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him 
For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Therefore it has no mastery over us because we share it. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not, now here again, the free will kicks in. God is wonderful, isn't he? Never takes that away, but he can do an awful lot more with us. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. We have great power, don't we, in our free will. We should not abuse. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but grace. Simple really. It's all about believing. It's all about faith. It's all about saying yes Lord. Yes Lord. I believe. I truly believe. And then things can start happening properly. What then shall we what then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to somebody, to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? It goes on there about what can happen if we abuse our faith situation. You know, psychologically, we could almost say, well, <clears throat> I, I can do this. Uh, God has forgiven me and will forgive me. Well, that's a downward slope. But I think I'm honest enough to say that things pop up. Things, especially in this age that we live, we're tempted Lead us not into temptation, Lord. You know what that really means? We get tempted. We turn to him and he takes us away. He leads us away from temptation. It's one of the aspects of the wonderful Lord's Prayer when you analyse it. But he's waiting for us. He gives us that wonderful ability to say yes or no. But the more we say yes, the more we will say yes because of him. And of course, we come into that scenario, how can it all happen? Of course, the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, again, powerful stuff, Holy Spirit. No, it is powerful. But it's simple. I and you receive it by saying yes to Jesus. The Spirit will come straight in. And you have to, in my view, and I speak from experience, you can only experience it. You can't say, well, prove it to me, and then I'll take another look. You have to say yes. I am not worthy. I am a sinner. I was born into that situation. This is where the whole Bible kicks in, really. And I don't like it, and I want to go in a better way. This is where the kingdom of God is available. The kingdom of heaven is available. I like the fact it says when Jesus started his ministry in the, in the three synoptic Gospels, he started by proclaiming, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. He puts it in that statement. And then, of course, follows all the wonderful teaching. But the kingdom of 
as I said before, there's about 150 references to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Many of them are along, are, are along the lines of the kingdom of God is at hand or is near you and I. In other words, you think, well, where can I go to the church and sign up? Or No, it's near because it's in us. It's available. But he's giving us that freedom again now, free, free will. I often pray to the Lord, Lord, take away, <laughs> perhaps not all, but take away some of this free will. I want free will for you. I want your will. I want to be free in your will, not my will. <laughs> so I do say, friends, that sometimes it's like that. It's never like that. Never. Because I want to be in the kingdom when I go through my death. And um, God's blessed me. A little bit of I didn't want to go into personal testimony, but I'll be 85 next uh, March, this coming March, and God has blessed me. Got things wrong physically, but nothing to in comparison. But I can't wait. I know my time is, could be today, could be five, ten years, I don't know. I know it's not long, <laughs> what I've already had in comparison. And so, in the fear of being a bit sort of greedy, if you like, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward. But today is the important day because I know that I should be sharing my life. God shared his life with me and I share my life with him, but I have to share my life with others. And I do what I can. And every now and again, things happen. A lot of it is with those close to me, like us all. Sometimes it's in complete happening as I walk the dog, for example. The reality of God's influence in our life is every second of our lives. References have often been made to ladies being in the kitchen, or men, of course, doing the washing up, doing it to the glory of God. Now, I understand that. That's a good example, actually, because I believe that as we get stronger in the faith, and it may be very quickly, that washing up doesn't appear like it used to be. You may even change the uh, whatever it is you put in the bowl or whatever. But it becomes not an irksome task, but something that God has given us. He's given us a kitchen. He's given us those plates. He's given us the water. He's given us the soap. Do you see how a menial task that we'd never probably think about? Thank you, Lord, for this water. Thank you for these plates. Hope I don't drop one. <laughs> because we're fallible, aren't we? But thank you. You go down the garret or you get your car out and you drive off. Thank you, Lord, for this car. Everything, every moment. And you know, friends, as you thank him, you're employing your faith and your faith is growing. I'm sure, Steve, when you vacuum this, as you've done many, many times, this carpet, I'm sure on some occasions you said, thank you for this hoover. I've had to go, I'd have to get on my hands and knees if I didn't have it. You know, there's, there's always a reason to thank God, whatever the situation we're in, whatever the, the, um, the situation, the purposes that are going on in our lives. Because, we have been crucified to our old selves, our old lives, albeit that we're on the journey still of here and now and our lives, but we're going to the celestial city. 
I pray that for all of us. Christianity is both very, very simple, but very, very powerful. I don't like the word deep, but it has got wonderful theology. And we're blessed here at this church, I believe, in, the, in uh, Glynn especially, but others, ex, ex, uh, their exposition on these. Um, I'll just finish here. But last Sunday, uh, if you were upstairs, uh, Glynn gave a, a wonderful exposition on, on the Word of God. And um, the last few comments uh, impressed me he said this, let's pray we will become more and more assured of God's word to us as a church and our calling to believe it and live it out. That is the ultimate aim of God's word for us to be in the kingdom but meanwhile to believe his word and to live it out with all the problems each day has enough trouble of its own I think we can also say that that original word included suffering but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well Spiritually, we receive as soon as we believe and confess ourselves. And our lives are changed and our lives will go into the kingdom. So it's spiritual first and then physically into the kingdom. It's wonderful, isn't it? We'd almost, in theology, we'd almost change it round the other way. But it's wonderful that God is saying that we receive the Spirit immediately we open up ourselves to him and believe. But then the day of the resurrection comes and we physically go into the kingdom and I guess spiritually be there forever. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and material. Thank you, friends. Amen.